Welcome to today's webinar uh, featured by uh, us here at Ivan and Google Cloud, and it is the future of cloud native data is now. So in today's world of microservices architecture, our applications are increasingly distributed across multiple nodes and machines. This is true. This makes it difficult to manage and maintain these applications, especially when it comes to data. Our data can be distributed and stored in silos, which makes it difficult for organizations, whether we're big or small, to extract value from that. Ivan's managed open source data services, along with Google's Kubernetes engine, help solve this problem by combining compute and data in our cloud native world. So today we're gonna go through the steps to help manage data in our distributed applications and see how we leverage data's inherent gravity to use it across all these different components. After we're done here, you'll have a better understanding about how Ivan and Kubernetes can help you manage your distributed applications and your distributed data. And you'll be able to start planning about how to improve the performance, scalability, and reliability of your distributed applications. The recording of today's webinar is gonna be available to all the registrants after the event today. And feel free throughout, drop your questions in the Q&A that you're gonna see over to the right. So a little bit about what we're gonna to do today as we sort of step through our agenda. We've got a little bit of an introduction. We're in the middle of that right now. We're gonna talk about what we mean by distributed computing. Think about the problems involved with distributed data. And we have an example story of an example application that deals with all of these things. And we're gonna show you live exactly how we do this with Kubernetes and with Ivan across multiple data systems. And then we'll, we'll, we'll handle our Q&A at the end. Let's introduce ourselves. My name is Maddie Stratton. I am the Director of Developer Relations here at Ivan. I have been part of the DevOps movement for quite some time. I'm involved in the Kubernetes community as well. And I've been doing operations for many more decades than I care to share right now. I'm also a podcaster. If you're into DevOps and podcasts, you can always check me out at arrestedevops.com. And joining me today is... I'm Kaslyn Fields, and I'm a developer advocate at Google, where I focus on Google Kubernetes Engine and open source Kubernetes. I'm also the co-host of a podcast, the Kubernetes podcast from Google. I'm also an ambassador of the Cloud Native Computing Foundation and a co-chair of the special interest group for contributor experience in Kubernetes. So if you're ever interested in contributing to open source Kubernetes, I hope to see you there. Uh, my primary focused areas are cloud native DevOps and especially Kubernetes type topics. And I like to make my own illustrations to help explain technical topics. And you'll see some of that today. So let's get in and start talking about distributed computing first. And for that, I will let Kaslin take us on the beginning of that journey. So today we're going to be talking about distributed computing with Kubernetes. Kubernetes is a tool that allows you to run your apps across many machines. You basically say, hey, Kubernetes, I need to run this application. And Kubernetes runs across a bunch of machines itself, which we call a Kubernetes cluster. So it can take that application that you gave it, and it goes and finds a machine within that cluster to run the app on for you. There are all sorts of tools that Kubernetes provides in order to do this really well, but hopefully you've heard of Kubernetes and are somewhat familiar with how popular it is. If not, allow me to say that Kubernetes is incredibly popular. Uh, so we can kind of let that popularity speak for itself on how good Kubernetes is at enabling distributed computing for your applications. Kubernetes is open source, and that means, well, doesn't necessarily mean, but in this case, it means that it can be run on just about any compatible machine. That means that your Kubernetes cluster might look like this one that I actually have in my office behind me, now that you can see it very well, but you can see it in this picture. Um, but the real point of Kubernetes is that it's designed for scale. It's designed to run thousands of applications across tens, hundreds, thousands, very rarely even tens of thousands of machines. So more commonly, using Kubernetes looks more like this, an engineer running their apps or accessing the cluster, which lives in the cloud, which as we all know is just someone else's computer or someone else's computers, possibly a lot of them. Today, we're gonna to be using Kubernetes in Google Cloud with our managed service, Google Kubernetes Engine. As I mentioned, Kubernetes is open source and can be run just about anywhere. Setting it up 
can be a little tricky though, or at least a little fiddly, depending on what kinds of hardware you want to use and how many machines you're working with. And with the distributed computing provided by uh, Kubernetes being such a powerful tool for cloud environments where you can very easily get a lot of uh, machines very quickly, basically all major cloud providers offer a managed service where their customers can get a Kubernetes cluster up and running pretty quickly and easily. In the case of GKE, that means the ability to start a cluster with just one click if you want to, plus some really nice built-in dashboards and GUI tools for working with the cluster. And Kubernetes, the open source project, was originally inspired by the way that Google runs workloads in its data centers. So it makes sense that we're pretty confident about dealing with the details of running those clusters for our customers. Later, we're going to be giving a little demo, and we're going to use GKE for the distributed compute side of it. Specifically, we're going to be using GKE in its default mode, autopilot mode. In this mode, you have some control over the nodes in your cluster, but for the most part, it's designed to be even truer to the just tell Kubernetes what you want it to run story. It uses the details in your Kubernetes deployment to pick the underlying machines for you and only bills you on the resources you actually use instead of the virtual machines that make up the cluster in their entirety. So there's kind of this whole spectrum of distributed computing regarding how much work you actually want to put into the underlying machines. And we're going to be kind of in the middle of that. So companies use Kubernetes to worry less about the details of managing their machines so that they can focus more on managing the apps they actually care about. Kubernetes allows them to make more efficient use of the cloud's scaling capabilities. Distributed computing allows businesses to split up big chunks of work into smaller bytes so their teams can be more focused on specific things too. And it enables businesses to use a variety of tools, including Kubernetes, of course, to centralize the intricacies of app and resource management. Distributed computing is great, but there are some challenges that are inherent with the distributed computing model, prime among them being data. Ultimately, there's a lot that Kubernetes alone provides for you, not to mention the extras that GKE provides. Like I mentioned, Kubernetes is super popular for Sorry. <clears throat> Kubernetes is super popular for good reason. Some have called it the operating system of the cloud, specifically Kelsey Hightower said that. And Kubernetes skills are in high demand. Businesses are running their applications in a distributed fashion, enabling them to make better use of their computing resources. But one gotcha kind of that I always talk about with folks who are new to Kubernetes is how running applications in Kubernetes necessitates a shift in how you think about apps and the data that they use. Kubernetes is great at making sure the machine your app is running on has the specs it needs to be able to run your app. But when you start talking about data, things get a little trickier. How much data does your app need to write? How much data does your app need to read? Is it reading that data from other places? What other apps or services in your architecture need that data? In its early days, Kubernetes was very well designed for stateless apps, that is applications with very few data requirements. But these days, Kubernetes runs all kinds of apps. And in order to fulfill the wide array of needs of data-driven or what we might call stateful applications, Kubernetes essentially makes you think about the compute side of your app and the data side of your app separately. The requirements for the compute side and the requirements for the data side are managed very differently. This shift in thinking can be really challenging if you're used to working in environments where your data is right there on the same machine as your app. But at the scale Kubernetes operates on, that's rarely the case. The tricky thing about data in a distributed system like we're talking about is the gravity of that data. So as Kaslin mentioned, previously we might be used to the fact that our data is sitting very, very close to our application, perhaps on the same machine itself or literally sitting right next to it. And the thing is, the closer you are to your data, the faster it is to access it. And that's just physics, right? We're used to those things being, but as we talk about globally distributed systems, that metaphor and that approach doesn't apply quite the same way. And again, we may have this globally 
uh, you know, if we're thinking about the idea of having a cluster that that is distributed globally, we don't want to necessarily have a cluster that spans the entire globe. Uh, the networking and latency would be quite frightening, but we're still thinking about its accessibility worldwide. So in a distributed system, your computers might be far away from each other, either geographically or just in terms of network design. And hopefully you don't even have to know what machine your application is running on. That's, that's one of the benefits of Kubernetes. We don't have to worry about which machine in the cluster it's happening. And as Kaslin talked about with GKE Autopilot, you worry even less about the details of that. So that's cool for like the application piece of this. But now we're bringing in the data and we say, you know what, I actually... The way that I'm used to reasoning about this means I need to know where this stuff is, right? We can distribute our compute, but when data enters the picture, there's a lot of things, especially dependencies, we have to worry about. The pieces of our app, and especially in microservices and chunks and parts, could be all over the place. And where is our data? And how does this come into play? And how are we reasoning about our data in this cloud-native distributed world? So when we think about what do we mean by distributed data applications and the data pipeline where this is all happening, and the world has shifted, right? We we can think back pre-Kubernetes, pre-all this, we might have been dealing with the LAMP stack, right? Where we kind of had Linux, we had Apache, MySQL, and PHP. And there was an operational database that had that I did reads and writes into, and it was all pretty straightforward. Well, it's been quite some time since that's been the world that we live in. And instead, we start to think about lots of different places because some of it is that our data is in different systems, which is just a matter of maybe I have this one operational database that's over in this data center and I've got another piece over here. But it's not just about different implementations, different systems of the same data where we want to bring them all into one big thing in the middle. But we can have different applications of that data in different platforms, different parts of our business and our organization and our teams use this same data in different ways. And we have these wonderful tools that help us put the lens we need to address that data the way that we want to, whether it's a matter about um, if I'm, I'm streaming this data into an operational system, into an analytic system, we're, for, we're taking action based upon it. And Sometimes we have to keep data isolated for compliance and security reasons as well, but then merge them appropriately in a downstream system. So it's not as simple as just copying data from one place to another and having a replica or a copy of it. It's saying what part of this can get moved from one place to another in as real time of a manner as possible. And that's how we're thinking about these data pipelines and especially using something like an event streaming technology like Kafka. So, and this is where Ivan comes in, into all of this, into how we reason about these pipelines and reason about these data systems that talk to each other. So Ivan is the trusted open source data platform for everyone. We were founded by four frustrated Postgres contributors who are tired of having to build the same disaster recovery solutions, security solutions, and access control solutions everywhere they went. So they went and built it into a single solution that gives the power of high-performing, enterprise-ready open source to those who need it without having to build it from the ground up. These are embedded patterns of success for operating these systems. And over time, we have incorporated additional high-performing services to meet the requirements we see in the market. And that's how we built the trusted open source data platform for everyone. So... Think about starting with the database you need at the core, your operational database, your piece of that, in this case, mostly Postgres. And you go out from there, adding streaming, monitoring, analysis, while bringing you controls for everything from complexity to cost and compliance. And here's the thing that is real important to remember is that the Ivan platform is more than just the sum of all those open source services that we provide. We normalize the ownership of popular open source technologies like Kafka, Postgres and open search with a platform that ensures all the services run reliably and securely across any environment with easy integration with each other and with third party tools because none of these things in your system operate in isolation. This is why it is the trusted open source data platform for everyone. So with Ivan, we look at all these different technologies available and you have you and your team have the most widely used and highest performing open source data services at their fingertips. You have all the ingredients and tools to create value quickly with one vendor and one consistent developer experience. You have access to our expert advice, 24-7 follow the sun support. 
And this is giving you the ability for critical use cases that were previously cumbersome and difficult, like cross-cloud disaster recovery, near zero downtime Kafka maintenance, and Postgres high availability are suddenly available, easy and reliable, in one data platform. The one place that you're that you're reasoning about this, just like you're thinking about Kubernetes as your application plane, that's your one place to think about that. This is the one data platform that is built around being distributed. And this gives you one place for all of these data cloud resources. You can look at all that data real estate in a single glance, whether it's about uptime to locality to cost, what you're running, where you're running it, and how much it costs you. Those are the things that we want to know. We can leave a detailed view of your infrastructure, health, and that single pane of glass. So let's tell a story. We are going to now take some time and think about an actual example of an application that is going to be distributed and is going to use multiple different distributed uh, data platform technologies and components. And we're calling this, this is a, a, an application we call Ticket Manager. Maybe we call it our fake JIRA. This is our system ins inside of our organization. We're saying we have a tool for managing tickets, for managing things that we do. But different people in the organization are going to want to look at different things connected to that. And here is my very detailed uh, application architecture of the Ticket Manager. But if we look at how this works, we're connecting a lot of interesting parts, right? So first of all, when we think about this ticketing app, it's one place where we're recording tickets and work that has to be done, whether they're, you know, made their feature requests, their, their uh, incidents, their things that are broken, bug reports. And so one person involved, one, you know, maybe a manager of a team wants to know the tasks that are assigned to the team and they want to do searches to see what people are working on. And we're going to use some technologies for that, but there could be someone else in the organization that says, we're looking at overall trends. We, or maybe we want to set an alert on if a certain number goes over a threshold. And different people in your organization want to use different tools for this. So if we take a look at how this is built, we say we have a backend app, which is kind of the main application, the ticket manager application. And we're going to distribute this and deploy this using Kubernetes. That's the runtime, right? And it's writing to Postgres as its operational database. That's where the tickets are being created, updated, deleted, all of that fun stuff is happening in a Postgres database. But that's just the beginning of the story. We want to take all of these things in real time as they happen. And we're using a Kafka connector to put all of these things that are updated in the Postgres database into Kafka for the streaming of that, which means we can now connect a bunch of other different technologies in front of it, including open search. And what when we kind of look at this the you know if you look on the right you see the uh, the user of this actual human being maybe that would be you or an end user or the manager or the person who's trying to run these other reports maybe the inner point is there's an api call that something is happening through the front end to be able to make the change to the data part cool that happens there but then when we're looking at things that manager who wanted to look and see the tasks assigned to the team they might use open search for that. So they're able to consume open search directly, but they're doing it through the Ivan platform. And that piece is there. But then even further than that, if someone's going to use Grafana, maybe to start mapping some of these things out and start visualizing these trends, because this is also happening in Ivan and Ivan's implementation of Grafana where it's running, everyone in this organization is using Ivan as their method for um, approaching to this. And this works for other distributed data problems as well. Maybe as, as ticket manager becomes larger and more globally scaled, we might have multiple Postgres instances that are all closer to their application or maybe a couple different applications of ticket manager, but we can use the change data capture function to move everything into a central data hub as in a Kafka cluster similar to this. So what we're going to do uh, today as we go through this, we're going to show how we can deploy the ticket manager application into Kubernetes to get that runtime out there. But we're connecting these things together using the Kubernetes operator, which means when we define our infrastructure in Kubernetes, we're also defining the data infrastructure of Ivan in Kubernetes. So it's one place where we say, these are all the things I need. This is how my application gets deployed. And here's all the data infrastructure it needs. So we're going to walk through how we get this application deployed, as well as defining it using the Kubernetes operator on Kubernetes, and then show a couple fun things we can do about that. So this seems like a really fun time to go into our demo. And I'm going to turn this over to Kaslin to start with the Kubernetes side. Let's dive in. All right. So here we are in Google Cloud. I mentioned earlier that we are, and 
Maddie mentioned as well that we're going to be using a, a GKE cluster um, to run our application on today. And I've got a couple of clusters spun up here. Um, you can see the first thing we've got is this nice little dashboard view where you can see all of your clusters and how many CPUs they're using and how much memory they're using. Um, these are autopilot clusters, so we care more about the CPU and memory usage than the actual number of nodes. We don't care about that at all, actually. Um, and then if I wanted to learn more about these clusters, I can click on one of them and I can see some more detailed views. So there's a whole bunch of detailed information on this view. We can see more information about the storage that's connected to the cluster directly. Um, there's some observability tools and uh, dashboards in here, as well as some tutorials and uh, suggestions for things you should learn. Um, we can see our logs. We can also see uh, errors from the applications running in our cluster. Um, so there's all kinds of these nice little tools that you can use to learn more about your clusters. Um, today, we're going to be connecting to our cluster. Actually, I want to connect to the other one. So let me uh, go all the way back to that main view, which will take me just a second because my internet is kind of slow. <laughs> so like I said, I've got two clusters here and I want to go into the other one. Ooh, creation view. Uh, that's another thing actually that I should mention. If you wanted to create a cluster, um, there's this create button, which I clicked and now it's gone. But when you go to create a cluster, this is what you see. Um, to create a cluster, you actually don't need to change anything. Like we said, you can create a cluster with a, one click. Um, but if you do want to change things like the name, the region that it's working out of, um, you can define some networking uh, details if you want a public cluster, one that can access the internet, or a private cluster, one that uh, can't access the internet, <laughs> doesn't, it isn't really accessible uh, from, well, yeah, details. <laughs> um, and you can also set up the cluster pod address range, all of this stuff. I actually have a video where I walk through the details of all of the things that you can do when you're setting up a cluster. Um, I highly recommend if you're creating a cluster for the first time to actually walk through all of that stuff and read about it because uh, it can teach you a lot. Anyway, as I said, I was going to log into this cluster. Uh, so the way I do that is there's a connect uh, button here at the top. So I'm going to use the cloud shell, which is a built-in terminal in Google Cloud to connect to this cluster. I could copy this and paste it in myself, or I can just hit run in cloud shell. So that's going to bring up the cloud shell for me, which will take a second. This is basically a Linux machine um, that is running in the cloud that I can just use to interact with things in the cloud. Uh, so I'm going to run this gcloud command to connect to the cluster. And when I run that, it'll go off and get the cube config. So now if I run kubectl, um, I should be connected to that cluster. And if I run kubectl get nodes, we mentioned earlier that in autopilot mode, you don't really care about the nodes, but you can actually technically still see them. Um, and I can see that the name of the cluster is right on that node. It's one of the easiest ways that I check that I'm in the right cluster. And it's one of the first things that I like to do because it helps me kind of know where I am in the cluster. So I'm now within my Kubernetes cluster. We also actually already installed the Ivan operator on this cluster, which takes like four commands. <laughs> it's actually very simple, but we wanted to focus in on the application that we're going to be using today. Uh, uh, so... To explain yeah. what an operator is. So what yes, the Kubernetes operator point. lets us do <laughs> is it lets Kubernetes control through uh, infra code, right? Through through code and config, other systems other than Kubernetes. So we're saying in Kubernetes, and you'll see as we step through our manifest, we're saying this is how the application part, how the Kubernetes pieces go. But oftentimes there's more to your application than just the runtime. And if you're able to use an operator is basically providing that abstraction, that API that says, I mean, hence its name, operator, it lets Kubernetes operate something else. In this case, it lets Kubernetes operate Ivan and create, configure, and, and manage uh, the instances in Ivan that we need to have, but doing that through Ivan's API the way that Ivan, and Ivan has created this operator for exactly this reason. Yeah, and those are defined with a custom resource definition or a CRD. I often see the terms operator and CRD used interchangeably. Um, 
And the concept of a custom resource definition is very much what it sounds like. We have all these resources in Kubernetes, like deployments and services, all these generic tools that you use to run your applications. Um, but some applications are a little more particular than others. So you can use custom resource definitions and operators to kind of customize the way that Kubernetes runs your workloads even more than uh, it does with its default things. So we're going to go ahead and run our app, right? Well, first, let's take a look. If you go into the into the, our app directory, I think I'm trying to think yeah. about where you're at. So we've already cloned out. We have a copy of the ticket manager ticket repo manager. that has the, the code, var various codes. If you take a look, it's got the source code and everything. But let's go take a look in that manifests directory. So in the manifest directory, what we've done here is, and we're going to go into the app. First, we're going to, we have two sets of the manifest. The manifest is fundamentally just the instructions for Kubernetes, right? So in the app directory, we have the ones that handle getting the application going and the things the application needs. So the Kubernetes.yaml uh, is really the thing that's most built around all of the fun Kubernetes stuff that we need to do. It says, uh, just for the application itself. And it says, all right, this is the container it's going to use. We've got a container build called Ticket Manager. These are the ports that it listens on. It should be under this load balancer. This is all Kubernetes stuff, very uh, typical Kubernetes. And if you know what you're doing with Kubernetes, this makes a lot of sense. If you don't, this is just instructions to Kubernetes. That's cool. You don't need to know what it means because Kubernetes knows what it means. So that's cool. Let's look at kind of the fun fun data parts. So first we'll look at the um the DB the uh sorry, this the PGCR, right? So this is the Postgres resource. We're creating the service in Ivan that Postgres is going to run in. So we do a couple things there. We say number one, this is a PostgreSQL as opposed to Kafka or MySQL. We're going to give it a name. And in this case, we're calling it PG Cloud Native. This is just its name inside Ivan, so we identify it. Now, we have to use a secret. You can't just go to Ivan and say, cool, let me just go create a project in Maddie's, Maddie's account. So we're using a secret, and we've already gone and, and taken that, that token from Ivan and stored it as a Kubernetes secret, which means it's something that this Kubernetes cluster knows how to use, but no human beings can really look at it or, or deal with that. So that's all fun and encrypted. Um, and then you'll see it has a pro the project name. And the project name here is DevRel Maddie. So we're naming it after me. This is basically saying this is the project and project is a group of resources. Um, and then we also have to say, hey, where do we want this to run? We're saying we want to run this in Google US Central 1, um, which I think it's dash one, Kaslin, if you want to fix that real quick. Central dash Oh yeah, one. it is. Yep. And... <laughs> This is, uh, and remember, we talked about having this be close to where it was. So US Central 1 is the region um, where our Kubernetes cluster is. So we could spin this up in Europe too or something, but then that seems not ideal because of physics. So this part here is basically our basic configuration for the um, just the Postgres instance itself. So you can go ahead and save this. And then let's take a look at the, at the database one. Um, which is the PGDBCR, this is actually saying the database that we want to have in there, it's going to look very similar. Um, the only thing that we need to change here, because this is saying what service are you going to use, but you'll notice the project says Dev Advocates. We just need to update this to use the project DevRel Matty because these are different configurations. In a more productionized environment, you could use variables. You could use a bunch of different ways to uh, optimize this. So just change the project to devrel dash Matty. Oh, right. I haven't changed this one yet. Yes. Devrel dash Maddie. Dash Maddie. Okay. And then what we're going to do, and we're going to go ahead after this is cleaned up, the fun part is we're going to go ahead and, and and make this happen. So we'll, we'll save this and we're going to run a Kubernetes command that is going to say, go ahead and go ahead and you need to go up um, to the root of the, um, the repo. Yep. Yeah. Up to so if here, you, I believe. Yep. yep. So yep. if you go ahead and run kube cuddle apply dash F manifests slash app. And this is telling Kubernetes to apply all of the manifests in the app directory and make these things be true. That was real fast. Um, <laughs> yeah. And I want to point out one thing uh, <laughs> we mentioned autopilot and um, that it charges you based on the resources that your workloads actually use. So it's telling me here that um, the way that these are designed, this is a demo app. We didn't do everything. <laughs> the, the resources aren't divine, defined clearly enough. 
um, for autopilot to know exactly how you, how much you need. So it's going to guess, um, but you should probably set those is what the warning is for. <laughs> set your resource requests and limits. <laughs> so that should be going along. We can see um, if we take a look at the resources, Kaslin, um, if it's oh, yeah. where, where we're at. Uh, you mean the, uh, the curl command? No, oh, the resources. No, no, actually. just uh, the right. deployment. Yeah. 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 KubeCTL, get deploy. I'm getting ahead of myself. Yep. Oop, I, I misspelled deploy <laughs> so you can see that that's not quite up yet yep. the command finishes quickly but uh especially because autopilot has to spin up some resources for this it's going to take it a minute if you want to sit and watch uh for when that comes up uh get deploy <laughs> you can do kubectl get deploy and put a watch on it with that dash w and then it'll just update when that's done um is there anything else that we can do while we wait? Well, I was going to say, minutes? why don't we go ahead and take a look at the integration uh, manifests as well? Because we've got a couple other pieces that, so this oh, is right. getting our application up. But remember, we talked about how this is going to interact with Kafka as well as, um, so if we take a look, for example, at the, we'll start with the, the Kafka CR. And this is now saying, okay, we're creating a Kafka service. We're going to go ahead and, and tell it the, the region and the project upon which to use. I'm going to need to fix that in all of them. <laughs> yes, we'll, we'll, we'll go, but that's, yeah. that's all right. We're going to step through a couple of things. But one of the other things we have done as well is we already have another cluster running that we've already spun up because some of these things take a little bit of time. Uh, to go go and spin up. So we're doing a little bit of the TV chef thing where, you know, we put the turkey in the oven and then lo and behold, we pull the turkey out of another oven um, because sitting and watching clusters get spun up is not anybody's idea of a good time. Um, if it is your idea of a good time, I'm not here to uh, to judge your, your hobbies. Um, yeah. I updated that region to US Central 1 as well. Excellent. So I one? think um, one of the things that we can go ahead and do is we can um, go ahead and I will uh, we'll, 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 we'll flip and change. I'll start walking through some of the things that we can do uh, with Ivan and how we're going to go ahead and set up some of those other uh, integrations and connections. Cool. And if I were to run kubectl apply-f manifests integration, just run everything in these this integration folder, then we would spin up all these connections to these uh, data sources. But you'll see, for example, we have the, um, the uh, actually, if you take a look at the service integration CR, that one is, yeah. is, is an interesting manifest, I think, because these are kind of some of the, the pieces and parts. So we'll start to see where these connections are happening. How do we connect, create a Kafka connector that's saying the source is the Kafka and is going to the Kafka connect. So we're defining all of these relationships and we're defining this. And also you'll notice this is all in the version control. This is all in the repository for the application. So it becomes very easy to deploy this in a consistent manner. Yeah, that's one of the major benefits of Kubernetes is these nice YAML files that you could put into your source control, which is one reason why we mentioned the uh, secret, the token earlier. You don't want to have those in here. <laughs> um, that's stored separately, um, but makes it all very repeatable. Would you like me to update this one or do you want to go ahead and... Uh, nope, we're going to go ahead show? and move to <laughs> our, our um, next piece of this. Cool. I'll let you take over. So we had sat and we have created our um, Postgres has been has been set up. And what I can do here is just to connect. And we're going to take a quick look at the um, at the data store that we have in there. So we can see the backend data that we were using and then figure out uh, some of the fun things we can do to take a look at that data. So here I'm here in my my terminal. And I'm able to pull from Ivan the endpoint where my database is going to exist. And so I can run this command, which is going to let me connect. Oh, nope. This is because copy paste is not my friend. Um,
this is giving me a p sql command that lets me connect to that database and now i'm saying okay we want to connect to the tickets database and in here i can just do the very simple say let's take a look at all the data that we have in here i'm just going to select star from tickets and the important part here is to understand that nobody cares about looking at from ticket there we go so this is this is the core data but when we look at this what are we going to do with this but we can see we have a bunch of tickets that have come in there are various different types but we want to reason about this information in a way because otherwise we're just looking at the operational store but how do we connect this into the other parts that we want to look at so one of the ways that we're going to do this is through um using um open search and an open search dashboard that is part of Ivan. So I'm here now in the Ivan console and we have all, you know, this is the Postgres. I was able, this is how I was able to determine how to connect to my Postgres instance. It's all built right into the Ivan console here. But now we're going to go take a look at how, when we go into our open search and we say, we want to analyze the data that exists in open search using open search dashboards. So now that the services are running, we've got them in there. We've, we've got some data loaded into them. We're going to go and take a look at um, some of the things we can do in, in open search. So uh, if we look at the dashboards here and we say um, we're going to go ahead and this gives us the, uh, the URL to go to, which brings us to this open search dashboard. And I needed to go ahead and copy the password to that. My apologies. Um, so we're able to log in with this. Again, this was presented to us and was built in. Except for the part when my password isn't working. Bear with me. My apologies here. Live demos. Yep. <laughs> AVN admin, right? Yep. Oh, no. Here we go. This one. That'll do it. Yep. So. When we're in here, if we um, we can look at, we go to um, stack management and we're looking at the index patterns. And this is what's basically telling us the things that we're interested in. And so we have a pattern around DBZ, which is basically saying that anything indexed under DBZ tickets, public ticket. Um, created by our, this is telling us to look for the things in open search connected by that Kafka connect connector we did. And um, in this pattern, we're also using the um, uh, time base. So because this is a thing that we are going to query upon. And so now if we were to take a look at the discover section here, we can see um, we don't have anything, nothing's in the last 15 minutes, but I might want to say, hey, let me look at everything that happened in the last, you know, um, two days. And then we can start to see the the number of things that came in. We build our queries around that and we can start to understand this. So this, again, is someone, if someone is building things inside of open search um, and they know how to create these queries, this is really powerful. But then we start to think and say, hey, we have this other use case of someone who wants to use Grafana and we want to create long-term analytics across looking at this data that we got shoved into open search here. And so for this part, we're going to go ahead and go back into our Ivan console for Grafana in our, in our project. And we're going to create a new Grafana service. So we don't have any cloud native Grafana. This is all brand new happening here. So we're going to um, say we're going to choose a Grafana service. And again, we probably want to put this one in our US Central because that's where everything else is. 
And now we want to say, how is it, where is this going to come from? And this is the fun thing because this is all in Ivan. So when I go to my integrations and I'm going to say, I want to receive data into Grafana and it says, where do I want to pull it from? So I say, okay, I want to pull it from the, in this case, it's the Dev Advocates project. It's an existing service. And we already have a service. It already knows to maybe pull this from the open source, you know, the OS cloud native. And this goes ahead and this gives us this connection. So now we've already got these things integrated. So now we want to customize it a little bit. So if we go back to our service, we just want to sort of see where it's at. It's sitting, it is rebuilding. It's going to take it a second to kind of uh, move along um, as it's building this, this uh, service connection as we just made a change to it. And once it's up, we're gonna be able to then go ahead and uh, create our data visualization on top of that. But again, similar to the way we saw in the other services, the Ivan console is giving us all of the places we're gonna connect because we are gonna connect to this over this service URI. It's telling us the username and the password that we will need to um, connect to these pieces as it is as it is rebuilding, which we can't get to right now because it's still rebuilding, but that's just to prove my point. Yeah. The really cool thing about this is that you're using a bunch of different like data sources and tools to work with your data, and then you kind of have them in a centralized uh, tool. And it, it's kind of, we talked about distributed computing and then we've got distributed data. <laughs> It's very much what we were talking about. And and that's really the thing when we think about how we're interconnecting these things and when all your data is distributed, not, like you said, not only is it distributed across geographies or across different applications, but across the different pieces of the platform, but you're still looking at this in one place. So the thing that mattered here is if we go back to the story and say, why did why did this matter? Is we already have a part of the team that's building and deploying the ticket manager application, and they live and breathe in Kubernetes. And they say, cool, we're going to create our configurations. We know we need to have this Kafka cluster. We know we need to have all this stuff. Now we have someone else that's outside of that team who says, I want to label, I want to layer some data visualization over all of this. I don't know anything about the Kubernetes world that's happening over there. I don't want to have to go into your version control system and add information into that. I just want to connect to that. But all of these things were accessible to them. The services that got built with our cluster, because it's sitting in Ivan, it's all right there. I don't know if folks are able to grasp. Hopefully folks have been able to kind of follow along with this to see how exciting this is, but I'm excited about it. <laughs> and now our, our Grafana is up. So I'm going to go ahead and grab this and let's go take a look at our Grafana setup right here. We're gonna go back in, we say, cool, we're gonna go in in our AVN admin. And once we are inside, we say we want to, um, we take a look at our connections. And so if we take a look at connections, we can see um, that we should, um, if we go to your connections, Uh, there it is. Yep. Sorry. It's not under your connections. There is the data source. So we can see the Avon, uh, Ivan open search OS cloud native that we have. So let's go take a look at that and we'll see uh, for the index name. We want to go ahead and set because we created this other index before the dbz tickets dot public dot ticket. And this is what's going to go ahead and say, this is the index that matters. And then the field that we use for the time field is actually TSMS, so the uh, timestamp millisecond. And then if we say get version and save, that's gonna go ahead and pull that particular piece. And then we're gonna go down here and say save and test. That's good. Apparently it liked uh, my pieces. So now we can actually create our Grafana visualization. So if we go over here, we're gonna go ahead and say explore. And then we're going to set our source to the Ivan Open Search OS Cloud Native. And we're gonna customize our query details. So we wanna sit down there and we wanna say, um, we have our count, the data integration is this, the interval is auto. And let's go ahead and say, we're gonna run the query. And if we go ahead and change the um, date histogram, so we can see we were able to pull in all of the counts and all of the pieces that uh, came in to this 
particular part. So now if we we've we've seen how all these pieces and parts go together, how we've been able to tell the story from the beginning all the way through how we're seeing what comes up in our queries, but there's even a little bit more to this story that we can tell. And one of the other things that we could do um is since our data is in Kafka, which is where we saw it, and we're synchronizing that to open search. But the thing is, because Kafka doesn't delete the messages like other message queues would, so we can keep using those messages for other things. So while you can see in our previous example, Kafka, the Kafka Connect was going to open search, but we can also put those messages into BigQuery with Google and be able to query them as well. And it's not just a one-way place, and that's a lot to do with the uh, power that we have available to us because we're using Kafka um, where this where this piece goes. So we are gonna, if we think about what have we learned today so far before we go into uh, our, our kind of wrap this up and, and go into answering some questions. So we've learned about how not only can our applications be distributed, but when we reason about our distributed systems, we're reasoning about the application, we're, we're defining how our application is distributed. We can put that same definition um, that we're doing in Kubernetes for how our containers get deployed, but also using the power of the distributed data platform of Ivan and define it there in one place but we're also able, because we have one consistent data platform, whether we're operating that data platform using uh, manifests in Kubernetes as part of building that application and deploying that application, but also how other folks within the organization use the Ivan platform to access and work with the data uh, in a way that's sent to them without them having to know those configuration models. The tricky thing with distributed data isn't just the physical gravity of data in terms of like its location. It's also, it's more so really the dependencies between different applications. So I think we're gonna take this time um, think to, to answer some of the questions. We've had some questions coming in to the Q and A. Uh, we're not gonna have time necessarily to get all of them, but we're going to, grab a few that uh, seem most uh, most relevant, most uh, most popular. So I think uh, one of the first ones we see in here here that I thought was a was a pretty good one where they, you know it said how do we how do you set up a Kafka connector? And we did that in a few different ways. So the Kafka connector, right that's that's key because we said we're we're streaming all this data into Kafka and we have all these different pieces, both the Kafka connection, from um, from Postgres, but also then how did we set up the Kafka connection for open search? And we can do that in two different ways. So one way we did that was with uh, inside the Kubernetes operator. So when we defined it in that, that configuration of the manifest, we had some manifest files that defined that um, piece, but then we can also if we were to go under inside of Ivan under the Kafka Connect service that was that would that we have, uh, there's multiple connectors there, so we're able to actually set those connectors up just the same way that we were able to graphically inside the Ivan platform set up that that Grafana connection. So we can also set those Kafka Connect services. Uh, I see a question in here that says, "What are other examples of use cases for Kubernetes operators?" Uh, Kaslin, what have you seen? Yeah. Kubernetes operators and custom resource definitions, I think I said earlier, I can see those two terms used interchangeably a lot, um, but such a huge deal when it first came out. I feel like all of the meetups <laughs> I went to were all talking about how to make your own operators, how to make your own custom resource definitions. I definitely see them the most with these stateful use cases like we're talking about here. Because like I was just saying, the issue with stateful workloads is not just the data. It's that there's all of these different connections of different applications that need to use the data, different applications that care about the state of that stateful workload, as we call it. Um, and because of that, they're much more sensitive to change. And one thing that Kubernetes does that I didn't mention earlier is it'll just restart your workload if something isn't going right. 
<laughs> so you've got these deployments, which is a tool that Kubernetes uses to manage these workloads. And you can say, oh, I need three copies of this workload running. And if one of them is misbehaving in a way that Kubernetes can understand, it'll just kill it and spin up a new one. And if your application is constantly being killed and then you're spinning up a new one, then how do you connect to that? And all sorts of questions happen, with, especially with these stateful workloads. And so there might be special things that you want to happen if Kubernetes does spin up another copy of that workload. So you can use custom resource definitions to kind of handle those uh, use cases and make Kubernetes do special things for your application. So I definitely see it the most in these kinds of stateful workloads where the application has a lot of things that depend on it. And so it needs to do special things um, to, to do what it needs to do. Great. Uh, I have a question that says, how do you make data local? I think that has to do with what can we do to help drive for that gravity problem that we talked about. Mm -hmm. And I guess one of the things you could do with that, if we think about in our model and our example, is that we might have if let's say if we had ticket manager for example deployed in multiple different geographies and places we would put um different postgres instances and services that were close to those different regions and then those connectors are all coming back to a unique unique place where we're able to sit down there centrally and layer our open search connection our grafana our big query so that's part of where this pipeline power comes in as well because there's parts of it that need to be close to where the application is and then there's parts of the data that need to be close maybe to the consumers of the data and we're able to by drawing it through this pipeline and connection and making those connectors that gives us that capability of not necessarily thinking do we scale the entire thing to every single corner of the globe where this exists but how are we getting that peak and that's where I think those connections come into play. And another couple things on that on the Kubernetes side. My first thought on this, by the way, Kubernetes history lessons are one of my favorite things. <laughs> when I first started getting involved with Kubernetes, they were just coming out with uh, uh, persistent volumes and persistent volume claims, which is how Kubernetes handles um, storage that's being attached to the cluster and how workloads can make use of that storage. Um, and having local volumes like on the nodes was a brand new thing. There's all kinds of problems with that because like we said, we don't know exactly which node your uh, app is running on. At least we shouldn't have to care. Um, so local in the sense of like on the same node can be all sorts of problematic on Kubernetes. Um, but also we talked about the global example of like your applications, your data is global. How do you make sure that they're all in the same places? Um, and like we said, maybe don't create a Kubernetes cluster that spans the whole world because the networking would be terrible. Um, usually the way people actually do that is with like separate clusters in each region. <laughs> so um, there's all sorts of interesting work going on there with managing multiple clusters if you're interested. I think we got time for one more here. I, I'm I'm curious the answer to this one myself. So so Kaslin, when would I not use Kubernetes? <laughs> Doesn't just Kubernetes solve every problem? <laughs> this is one of my favorite things to talk about. I I talk about it a lot actually because one of my favorite things to do is to help folks who are new to Kubernetes start to understand it. And so the first thing when you're learning something new, especially in technology, is you want to try it out yourself, right? So everybody's like, oh, I'll make a blog site and I'll run it home on Kubernetes or something like that. And they're always like, what would be a good use case for me to try out at home that I could use Kubernetes for? And I'm always like, about that. <laughs> Like I was saying, Kubernetes is really meant for these really large scale use cases. It's meant for kind of enterprise level uh, scale. So anything you do at home is not going to be a super good uh, analogy for how Kubernetes is supposed to be used. I do know people who use Kubernetes clusters to run like home automation and stuff. And there are some interesting use cases there where you've got a whole bunch of different um, devices and different systems and there's a bunch of stuff that you need to run and Kubernetes can help you kind of manage that. Um, but on average, most people don't need Kubernetes for smaller use cases. It only really becomes important as you get to these larger and larger scales. 
which I think is is probably most of the people on this 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 webinar who joined. We joined in a webinar to talk about distributed computing, distributed data. Uh, that said as well, but even if you don't have the large scale problem that would uh, bring you towards Kubernetes, like Haslin said, Ivan can still still help you all the way down to the smallest little operational database that you need. Just giving you that abstraction and not having to think about how it gets deployed and and where it gets deployed, but. If you join this webinar, you probably have some of the problems that things like Kubernetes and wide-scale distributed data will, will help you solve. And speaking of deciding to join this webinar, thank you so much for joining us uh, on this, this webinar about the future of cloud-native data. Uh, you can feel free to follow Kaslin and or myself on social media. We'll drop our links into the chat for you where we can, you can always find us there. We're also speaking of links, we have a bunch of references and other things about getting started with all of these technologies and ways to be able to connect with that. We'll drop those along uh, in the recording, which will be available in the next couple of weeks. We'll also be sending you those links when we send you the links to the recording. So thanks again for joining us today. And we hope that you go and distribute your data and distribute your applications and have amazing success.